uh, because he's he's done so well, it would take you know half the talk to describe this stuff. But I will tell you that I am personally very excited to see him present today because I think his work on this uh, on his new imaging modalities um, is some of the most exciting, uh, innovative, uh, and really novel and creative stuff uh, in the field of nanomedicine. And so I'm very excited to see uh, what he's uh, going to present to us today. So I won't take any more of his time. Mikhail, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, have a great talk. Oh, and everybody, real quick, again, mute, but cameras on. Sound off, cameras on, please. Thank you. And cameras on if you, if you can. I just, I, I just enjoy having uh, kind of quizzical facial expressions or doubtful ones if I'm not explaining something uh, well. So uh, thank you very much, uh, James, for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. It's really great to be here um, and, and visit so many friends and, and hopefully meet some new ones. Um, let's get the sharing going. Hopefully this will just work. All right. Um, okay. So um, let me get the video. Okay. I think this should be fine. Um, <clears throat> all right. So thanks again uh, for having me. And um, the topic of today's uh, seminar is going to be about talking to cells. And so what do I mean by that? So the central challenge that we're trying to solve in our lab is how to image and control cellular function deep inside the body. And this is important, first of all, for basic biology, because whether we're talking about neurons in the brain or microbes in the gut or immune cells and cancer cells duking it out somewhere else in the body. Um, ideally, to understand how these cells work, we want to study them within the context of the intact tissues and all the other cell types that are there and all the physiology that's going on and not just looking at them under a microscope. And so to do that, we need techniques that can allow us to access these cells within these living tissues. At the same time, we and others, including uh, many of you at Georgia Tech, are interested in developing cells as diagnostic and therapeutic agents. And there have been some spectacular successes in this, for example, with immunotherapy, uh, where uh, T cells can be engineered to better fight uh, cancer and injected into patients' bodies and you know, have gotten FDA approval. Um, another example is probiotics, like the ones you might have eaten in your yogurt this morning, but they're now being engineered so that they can go through the gut, detect inflammation, and release anti-inflammatory compounds. And with these very sophisticated cell-based therapies, it's a little bit of a black box right now, because after we inject them into somebody, we don't have very good ways to tell where are they. Um, are they alive? Are they performing the functions that we wanted them uh, to execute? And we also don't have very good ways to tell them what to do based on their location uh, inside tissues. And so we want to be able to communicate with these cells as well as we deploy them as diagnostics and therapeutics. Now, the reason this is very challenging to do right now is because if we think about the techniques that are currently available that are really good at imaging and controlling cells, most of them are based on light. Um, and these are things like fluorescent proteins or optogenetics that many biologists use in their daily uh, practice. And they derive a lot of their power from the fact that they're genetically encodable. So we have very good ways to plug them in intimately to what's happening inside cells. But as you know, light doesn't penetrate very deeply into tissues. Um, and there's a huge body of work of people trying to extend photons of how far can they go, but it's really hard to beat kind of a limit of about a millimeter scale for, for penetration into tissue before the photons get scattered. And so it's difficult to scale these techniques up to larger um, organisms, even, even organisms as small as mice. At the same time, we have technologies like ultrasound and magnetic resonance that are based on penetrant forms of energy. Magnetic fields and sound waves, by and large, have no problem getting in and out of tissues, which is why if you go to your hospital, you see MRI machines and ultrasounds all over the place as opposed to optical uh, interrogators for, for the body. The problem, of course, is that these techniques have not yet been connected as well to what's happening at the molecular and cellular level. And so that's the problem that we're trying to solve in our group. Basically, take the physics of sound waves and magnetic fields and extend these capabilities down to the cellular level through biomolecular engineering, meaning that we find, we engineer, we evolve proteins or other genetically encodable materials that have the right physical properties to, instead of interacting with light, to interact with sound waves and magnetic fields. And so quite literally, the work in our lab breaks down along these lines. We have sound waves, we have magnetic fields, and we're trying to engineer biomolecules that allow us to use these forms of energy to either image or control the function of cells. Now, for today's talk, I'm going to focus exclusively on sound waves. Um, I think there's a, a lot of interest in, in ultrasound at Georgia Tech, so I thought I'd cater to you guys. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about the imaging side, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, at the end about um, control. 
So why are we so excited about ultrasound? Um, well, first of all, what, what is ultrasound? Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it in practice um, from a very early age, but um, it's very simple technique. It's based on sound waves propagating through a tissue um, until they encounter an interface with something that has a different density or stiffness, and then some of that sound wave will get reflected or scattered back. And we can tell how deep this interface is by looking at the timing between when we emitted the sound wave and when it came back to us. And then we can sweep the beam left and right um, and obtain images like this one on the bottom left that I'm sure most of you have been in. Uh, and you can see already that this, this shows you that ultrasound can actually penetrate pretty deep you know, into tissues. You can see that it gives you nice outlines of interfaces between bone and soft tissue. But you know, this image doesn't really tell you what modern ultrasound can do. Uh, and so I'm here to tell you, if, if you don't already know, first of all, that ultrasound without any special tricks can get, give you excellent spatial and temporal resolution. In our lab, routinely, we get spatial resolution of about 100 microns. Um, it's very fast. It takes tens of microseconds for the sound wave to go in and come back. So we can get temporal resolution below a millisecond. And we can penetrate several centimeters into depth, um, no problem. Even better, recently, there's been quite a big advance in super resolution ultrasound. This is based on principles similar to uh, optical super resolution, where you have stochastic sources that are letting you beat the diffraction limit. And in this case, you're looking at work from Mikhail Panther in Paris. This is a rat brain in cross section, and the microvasculature here is resolved at seven micron spatial resolution. Uh, centimeters deep in this tissue, so really remarkable. The other thing about ultrasound uh, compared even to MRI is that it's relatively accessible and inexpensive. So today you can buy an ultrasound system for $2,500 that is entirely contained within this handle here, so all the electronics and signal processing, and just hooks up to your smartphone, and you're off and running and doing ultrasound. So it has a lot of nice uh, capabilities. Now, here, you're just looking at anatomy and physiology with blood flow, so ultrasound is not yet connected to cellular function, so we need something to be able to make that connection. And what people have focused on um, in the past and continue to use in clinical practice are synthetic contrast agents for ultrasound, and the most uh, common of these are called microbubbles, and as the name suggests, these are micron-sized bubbles of gas stabilized by a lipid shell or protein shell. And uh, because they're filled with gas that has a lower density and is more compressible than the surrounding aqueous media, they're really good at scattering sound waves. And so if you inject them in the vasculature, you can see blood vessels very nicely. And in fact, that was used uh, in this beautiful work here. So, you know, we'd like to image cells, right? And it's going to be very hard to use these bubbles to image cells because, first of all, these bubbles are like the size of a cell. Um, they're also thermodynamically unstable. Um, and uh, difficult to connect to cellular function. So the question we asked a few years ago is, can cells make something like this um, themselves? And you might say, that's a crazy idea. Where are you going to find an air bubble uh, that a cell can make? But in this regard, nature really gave us a gift. Um, and in particular, we found what we needed in organisms like these ones. Um, so these are uh, colorful bodies of water near San Francisco. Uh, and the color in them comes from photosynthetic microbes that live in the water that need sunlight for energy. And to access that sunlight evolved a way to become buoyant, to have little flotation devices that bring them to the top of the, of the water. And those little flotation devices are these really unique, self-assembled intracellular protein nanostructures called gas vesicles. Um, this is a, a TEM image of one of these that we've purified from a cyanobacterium. You can see that the structure is a couple hundred nanometers uh, in dimensions. And what's special about it is that it's a protein shelled structure that encloses a hollow air filled compartment on the interior. Okay, so we have this two nanometer thick protein shell that is actually in a crystalline like um, arrangement. And inside of it is gas. Now, what's the gas? Well, it's whatever is dissolved in the surrounding media will partition in and out according to its Oswald coefficient. So you'll have oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor on the inside. But water is prevented from coming in and condensing into a, a liquid on the interior because the inside surface is so hydrophobic. Um, and this is you know, a remarkable self-assembled protein structure. You know, what makes it? Um, and what makes it is a genetic program um, that um, most of the gas vesicle is made from a single 7 kilodalton tiny protein uh, subunit called gas vesicle protein A 
that is assembled in this crystalline uh, kind of uh, structure. Um, and in addition, there are a bunch of other proteins that play either chaperone roles to help assemble the structure or are minor constituents um, that help uh, nucleate the formation of the structure or keep it together. I just want to show you a few more uh, TM images. Um, this is a few of these gas vesicles on a grid. You know, if you're into nanotech, you will admire nature for making something that's so monodispersed, at least in diameter. Um, and there's some polydispersity in length because the way these structures form is that the tips at the end form first, and then it fills in from the inside out and grows. Um, and uh, so you get some polydispersity in length. We can also break these things with pressure, and this is what it looks like after they've been collapsed. So you can see on the TEM grid, and all the air that's inside of them will dissolve um, after you um, collapse them. So we looked at these things and said, okay, well, this, they're filled with air, so maybe they'll be able to scatter uh, sound waves. And indeed, that turned out to be true. Um, so uh, in our earliest experiments, we just took purified gas vesicles, again, got them from Santa Bacteria, put them into um, hydrogels, which are acoustically transparent, here they are in these hydrogels with um, different concentrations in the picomolar range. And we saw a very nice ultrasound contrast at a bunch of different you know, relevant uh, ultrasound frequencies. So that was great. And we kind of got excited and we said, OK, well, let's see if we can see it in a mouse. And so in our earliest experiments, we just purified some gas vesicles, injected them into the tail vein of a mouse, and we're imaging the liver of the mouse because, as you know, um, the liver clears particles of this you know, size range very well. And so we were hoping that we would see the, the uptake into the liver. So let me start the movie. We have the injection going on. <clears throat> and over time, you see the liver going from being dark to becoming bright uh, and filled with this ultrasound contrast. And this was, to our knowledge, the first time that a biomolecule could be seen with ultrasound um, inside of a living, breathing uh, animal. And so um, this got us really excited. And, and we take a lot of inspiration in our lab from the history of fluorescent proteins, where in the early days, um, when GFP was first uh, moved over from jellyfish into other cell types uh, and discovered, there were all these very basic questions about it, like, why is it green? And how do you make it blue? And what determines how bright it is? Um, and what kind of cell types can it be expressed in? How does the, the chromophore fold, et cetera? And from studying these basic questions, um, ultimately gave rise to the beautiful technologies that uh, people use every day, like multiple different colors uh, of fluorescent proteins, functional imaging, where here we're looking at uh, neurons firing and calcium coming in, thanks to calcium sensors based on fluorescent proteins, or even actuation, where you can shine light and cause these proteins to dimerize, undimerize, and thereby control um, cellular processes. And so um, basically, you know, our, what we're interested in is everything that you can do with fluorescent proteins in, under a microscope or in, or, or in an optically accessed biological specimen, we want to be able to do with ultrasound deep inside of tissues. Um, and over the last few years, we've had a lot of fun kind of studying a lot of basic questions and just trying to test the capability, basic capabilities of our acoustic proteins, these gas vesicles. And the fun thing about it, and I'll, I'll give some, some examples in just a moment, but the fun thing about it is that it's a very weird protein. Uh, like, instead of thinking about fluorescent proteins and quantum yields and extinction coefficient, we're thinking about nonlinear mechanics. Uh, so like we had to team up with uh, collaborators in aeronautical and mechanical engineering to study how these uh, um, uh, structures respond to acoustic pressure, and they have this beautiful buckling uh, kind of phenomena. The genetic uh, engineering challenge has been amplified by the fact that we're dealing not with one protein, but with 8 to 14 proteins, depending on what species it come from, that have to work together and be at the right stoichiometry to assemble these structures. Uh, and that's challenging to work with all these proteins, but at the same time, it gives us more things to mess around with and engineer and see what happens. Um, We've had to, at the same time, optimize the way the ultrasound is transmitted and received to interact with these things, right? Just like in optics, people had to develop um, confocal microscopy and multi-photon microscopy to try to get as much specificity as possible from uh, these uh, fluorescent proteins. You know, similar thing here. We have lots of opportunities to work on the ultrasound end. And of course, we want to uh, apply this to imaging things like gene expression or sensing dynamic events. Uh, that are happening inside of cell like uh, enzyme activity. So I just want to give you a couple examples of um, what we've had to do here. 
so one of the biggest questions was whether we could take the genetic program from cyanobacteria or archaea and move it into the cell types that, that people are actually interested in studying uh, inside the body. And we started doing that with bacteria because, um, well, we thought it would be easier to move from one prokaryote to another. Um, and so the idea was that can we engineer microbes to have these acoustic reporter genes that will cause the expression of gas vesicles that would allow us to image them in places like the gut, or as you'll see in a, in a little bit, uh, also inside of tumors where they migrate. Um, and the idea for why this is necessary is, first of all, for basic microbiome research. Um, you know, you, you probably know that the microbiome is important, especially in our gut. Uh, but what's maybe less appreciated is that most of what we know about the mammalian microbiome comes from studying one sample type, uh, poop, uh, that is not very spatially representative of what's happening inside of the uh, GI tract. Depending on where you are, you have totally different bacterial populations doing different stuff. Uh, and interacting with the host differently. So to study it, we'd like to be able to see these things inside of the living organism. In addition, there's a lot of interest in engineering various species of bacteria to act as diagnostic and therapeutic agents inside the body. And this takes advantage of their ability to populate the GI tract, to home into and engraft in tumor cores. Um, and we would like to be able to see these cells um, and, uh, and ideally control them as well. And so, uh, to make a long story short, we had to do quite a bit of genetic tinkering. Um, and <clears throat> this slide just summarizes some of this tinkering. And the bottom line is that at the end of the day, it, we had to create a hybrid gene cluster where we were taking gas vesicle proteins from two different species, Anabinus plus aquae and Bacillus megatherium, to create a hybrid gene cluster that uh, has the performance that's shown on the right here. So now we can take um, uh, whole cell EM images of E. coli and we see gas vesicles formed inside of them. We can lyse them and see the, the gas vesicles. And most importantly, now these are hydrogels where we're looking at not purified proteins, but at living uh, bacteria that are induced to express the gas vesicles. And we can see them with ultrasound. We call the genetic construct here ARG1 or acoustic reporter gene one. And if we really push this expression, we can just make cells that are full of these gas vesicles. And um, it, it, to the point where we can make the E. coli float, which is kind of, kind of fun. Uh, now, looking at this image, you might say, whoa, like, is that cell uh, happy to have so many gas vesicles inside of it? And I'll say two things about that. Uh, first of all, um, TEM exaggerates because it's a 2D projection. Uh, and second of all, um, th this is an extreme case. We don't have to push the expression so hard uh, to get ultrasound contrast, but we did it here just to make a point that we can do it. And, and there's a lot of um, kind of viability assays that we've done to compare and show that uh, gas vesicles are no more burdensome than a fluorescent protein or a luminescent protein. Okay, but more importantly, now that we have uh, this acoustic reporter gene, we can connect it to genetic circuits. And this is an experiment that has been done countless times with fluorescence or luminescence, where you have a very simple circuit where the bacteria is responding to a sugar, IPTG, and there's a transfer function between the input and the output. And in this case, as we titrate different amounts of IPTG, we can look at the ultrasound contrast now and see this uh, expected uh, pattern of response. So now we, by ultrasound, we can see the output of, in this case, a very simple uh, genetic circuit. Um, you may also wonder about the sensitivity. And at the time of this publication, we could detect about 100 cells per ultrasound voxel. And the voxel is a three-dimensional pixel uh, that in this case has dimensions of about 100 microns uh, on the side. And so this put us into a concentration range that's relevant for a lot of uh, GI uh, microbes, not all of them, and so we're continuing to uh, kind of push the sensitivity, but uh, it put us into a range of um, relevance. And so what does this look like if we try to image something in the GI tract? Well, the bacterium I showed you earlier is actually the strain of E. coli called uh, Nissel, which is a probiotic um, that's approved in Europe um, and goes into the, the GI tract. Uh, in this case, we did kind of an artificial experiment where we injected these bacteria in hydrogel into the GI tract, and you'll see why we did that in just a second. Um, and we actually created a little arrangement of these bacteria in the colon where we had two types of bacteria. We had our acoustic bacteria expressing the acoustic reporter genes on the perimeter of the colon, and we put luminescent expressing bacteria into the center. Okay? Now we take an ultrasound image and we see this expected pattern where the acoustic ones show up and the ones in the middle stay dark. We can also flip this arrangement, put the acoustic cells in the middle and luminescent ones on the outside, and now we have more signal coming from the middle of the lumen. And so ultrasound is giving us the spatial information. Now we can take these same mice and look at them with luminescence imaging, 
And this is what it looks like. So yeah, you can see that there's stuff in their gut, but the spatial information of that distribution got scrambled because the photons are getting scattered on their way out of the body. So this just shows you kind of why you would want to have an ultrasound um, imaging technique uh, to look at this. Now, since this work, we've extended it further, and just want to show you some recent uh, unpublished data, where we're interested in tracking bacteria as they're homing into tumors. And this is there's a whole exciting field of tumor homing microbes, and one of the challenges is actually visualizing what is their biodistribution within, uh, within these tumors. And so here we engineered bacteria to express uh, gas vesicles using a, a next generation set of acoustic reporter gene constructs. We let them migrate into the tumor. Um, then we induce them uh, by, by injecting uh, an inducer molecule, let them express the gas vesicles in situ inside the tumor, and then look and see what's going on by ultrasound. And so when we do that, here's an example. So we, we, do, um, we let the bacteria colonize, we induce them, and then uh, a day later we look. And so this is the tumor in grayscale. This is the, the tumor anatomy. This is a, an amplitude modulated ultrasound sequence that helps us specific, more specifically see the signal coming from the gas vesicle, gas, gas vesicles. And we see this pattern of gene expression. And this is actually ex expected because the bacteria, after, if you do sectioning of the tumors, tend to colonize at this interface between the necrotic core and the thriving um, outside um, of the tumors. And uh, now we're seeing this in the living animal without having to sacrifice and cut it into little pieces. Uh, we can collapse the gas vesicles with pressure in C2, let them re-express uh, again, and we see, we see that signal again. And in controls where we either don't induce the bacteria or where we're inducing fluorescent protein controls, we just see this dark tumor. And to kind of corroborate this pattern of gene expression, we can subsequently take these tumors, section them, and stain for the bacteria. And you can see that the kind of pattern of colonization we get here uh, matches up with that. So again, this is highlighting the ability of ultrasound to give you information in living animals about how things are distributed on a 100 micron uh, spatial scale. So pretty, uh, we're pretty excited about this result. Okay, so you know, you look at it and say, okay, fine, you did this in bacteria, like you know, transferring genes from one prokaryote to another um, is you know, it's difficult, but not that crazy difficult. Could you ever do this in mammalian cells? And I have to say that <clears throat> um, we had. A lot of doubters, um, including ourselves to some extent, certainly paper reviewers and grant reviewers. Um, and it took you know, a really courageous leap uh, to think that um, it would be possible. And, and you know, I credit um, the grad students in, our, in my lab for really taking on the challenge uh, and pushing it forward. And so the question is, you know, can we take all, all of those genes, you know, eight to 14 genes, some, some number of them, and get them expressed in mammalian cells at the right stoichiometry relative to each other? have all of those individual genes fold correctly in this different type of intracellular environment and function to form uh, these kind of gas vesicles. And the way we proceeded, again, I'm just going to summarize this briefly, is that we first created mammalian codon optimized versions of all the genes uh, from a um, gas vesicle expressing uh, operon, uh, co-transfected them transiently into cells, and showed that we could form some gas vesicles. Okay, now you're co-transfecting nine plasmids, you're getting very random distributions of stoichiometries uh, inside of these uh, cells, but nevertheless, that was enough to produce some gas vesicles. And then the challenge was to take all, all these and put them together into mammalian versions of polycystronic operons. Uh, and so here, we kind of pushed some synthetic biology techniques to, to their limits. Like for example, here we have almost all the genes strung together with 2A elements that are derived from uh, viruses, where you have, uh, in principle, a one-to-one -one stoichiometry between one gene and the next. And so stringing together this large number of genes and seeing that this technique actually works for that was pretty, pretty uh, eye-opening, and it actually worked. Um, so we could string all these genes together. But we had to have uh, redundant versions of some of these genes uh, to boost their stoichiometry. And one of the genes, actually one of the main structural proteins, kind of refused to have these 2A peptides uh, appended to it, so it had to be on its own. So, but now we, you know, we have this set of three genetic constructs that if you take them together, integrate them into the genome of a mammalian cell, you can start to form gas vesicles. So this is thin, a thin section electron microscopy of an HEK cell that's expressing gas vesicles, and you see these bundles of gas vesicles formed uh, inside of the cell. And they're, it's not very efficient. They're, not, they're occupying only a tiny fraction of the cytoplasm, according to our estimates. But uh, it turns out that this is sufficient for us to now get ultrasound contrast in these mammalian cells. And so uh, in this example, 
we're again <clears throat> connecting these acoustic reporter genes to a simple genetic circuit. In this case, it's driven by doxycycline antibiotic. And we can see as we increase doxycycline, now this is looking at live hex cells in a hydrogel. Uh, we see this expected increase in signal uh, via ultrasound. Um, we can also follow kinetics of expression here over several days. Uh, and we can ask the same question about sensitivity as we did in the bacterial case. And uh, as of that paper, we were able to detect about four mammalian cells per voxel. So it puts us in, in quite a high sensitivity uh, regime um, compared to you know, virtually any other non-invasive uh, imaging technique. So that was, that was quite exciting that we can get, get to uh, a pretty low level. So what does this look like in vivo? Um, so here again, we used uh, tumors and exploited the fact that tumors are heterogeneous. Now, in this case, the tumor cells themselves are engineered to express uh, the acoustic reporter genes. And what we know about tumors is that they tend to be more vascularized on the perimeter um, of the tumor. And so if you're systemically injecting an inducer, based on the diffusion of that inducer and also the availability of oxygen and other nutrients, we expect to see more expression towards the perimeter of the tumor. And that's hard to see by light uh, fluorescence because it gets scattered, but we were hoping to see this pattern by um, ultrasound. And so when we look at the tumor, now here in grayscale is the background anatomical image. That's the skin up there. The tumor is located here. And in the red scale is the acoustic reporter gene signal that we're getting. And indeed, we see this pattern of signal that seems to be around the periphery um, of the tumor. And then we can subsequently section that tumor and look at it by fluorescence microscopy. And indeed, we see that, that the gene expression is localized um, in, in that kind of spatial pattern. This was reproducible across, uh, across animals. Uh, we also implanted a tumor here exp expressing a fluorescent protein. When we look at it by ultrasound, we don't see any uh, um, uh, gas vesicle specific signals. We just see the anatomical image. Um, and we can also look at it by fluorescence. So here we shave the back of the mouse. This is that red tumor. And yeah, you can see that there is a bunch of cancer cells there, but you lost the spatial information about what's happening uh, on the interior. And so again, this, this highlights what um, ultrasound can do. Um, so you know, we're quite excited about where this stands. I think we've shown that um, in principle, we have acoustic reporter genes that can work in uh, bacteria, that can work in mammalian cells, but we're still at the very early days of this technology. And um, just wanna be kind of open about the challenges that we're continuing to work on and other people in the field are starting to work on. Um, so we have to reduce the size and complexity of the gene construct. Nobody wants to work with those three clunky uh, polycystronic operons. We need to make it smaller um, to the point where we can put it into viral vectors and you can just sprinkle it on your cells uh, and start imaging them with ultrasound. Um, I showed you expression in cell lines. Now we need to do it in primary cells that are a little bit trickier uh, to work with like neurons and immune cells. Uh, we have quantified the, the metabolic burden of expressing gas vesicles, uh, and it seems to be similar to uh, fluorescent or luminescent proteins, but we want to continue to minimize it um, even further. And we need to show in, in every scenario biologically that we're applying this to that the function of the cells, not just their viability, is unaffected. Um, we're working with a bacteria-derived protein, um, the same issue that's faced by uh, Cas9 or channel rhodopsin. Uh, and so we have to worry about immunogenicity and study and address that. And of course, just like nobody today uses the original GFP, um, you know, we're working on versions 2.0, 3.0, et cetera, of these acoustic reporter genes. So that's using them as um, kind of reporters of gene expression, right? Where we're connecting them to a promoter whose activity tells us something about the state of the cell. Um, and that's useful in a lot of scenarios. But in addition, we'd like to push further. And so our inspiration for that is, again, what's been done with fluorescent proteins, where their signal has been connected to all kinds of stuff that happens more quickly post-translationally inside the cell. For example, cleavage by proteases or concentrations of certain metals like calcium uh, or zinc or activity of other enzymes like kinases and phosphatases. And the idea is that the presence or activity of these different molecules that we're trying to image changes the fluorescent output um, of the fluorescent protein. So could we do something similar acoustically? And uh, to tell you about how we're doing that, I just want to step back and tell you about one other protein in the gas vesicle uh, gene cluster called GVPC. Uh, and this is a protein that sits on the outside of the gas vesicles and acts as a stiffener 
It's an alpha helical rod-like protein that's repeated in multiple copies. And when it's present on the gas vesicle shell, it makes it resist deformation. Um, and we initially had very nice ways to strip it off uh, biochemically from the surface. And so we could produce gas vesicles that lacked this GVPC protein. And what we saw is that their acoustic output changes. Um, so in this example, we're transmitting at a frequency of four point something megahertz. And when we receive our signals, when we have the stiff gas vesicles, we just see that fundamental frequency in purple. When we have the more flexible gas vesicles, we see that plus a harmonic signal at double the frequency. And then subsequently, when we've looked with larger bandwidth, we can see additional frequencies um, coming up. And this is happening now, we have evidence for, for this happening, uh, is because of this buckling interaction that I mentioned briefly earlier. So this is a finite element model of one gas vesicle responding to six cycles of a sound wave coming through. And what's happening here is the sound wave is like a very nice sinusoidal pressure wave. But the buckling is converting that nice sinusoid into a set of step changes that are happening at the frequency of the sinusoid. And that very naturally, if you do a Fourier transform, is going to give you these uh, kind of harmonics. And we don't have to do it. We don't have to visualize that by using these additional frequencies. We can do it at the fundamental frequency by employing techniques like amplitude modulation that were previously developed for um, other ultrasound contrast agents. And I'm not going to go into the details of how that works, but just want to show that when you use these nonlinear pulse sequences like amplitude modulation, you can selectively see only those gas vesicles that have this ability to buckle that are softer, and you turn off the signal from the stiff ones. Okay, so we're going to take advantage of that. And so the idea for our biosensors <clears throat> is that can we engineer GVPC so that it responds to things that we're interested in sensing in a way that changes the stiffness of the gas vesicle and thereby turns on or off this nonlinear signal? And the first uh, time we did this was focused on proteases um, because they're you know, the very important class of uh, enzymes inside of cells uh, and outside of cells. And uh, frankly, uh, we thought this would be the easiest starting point because when a protease cleaves a protein, that is a huge conformational change. Uh, and so the way we made our sensors is that we engineered GVPC to strategically contain uh, recognition sequences that are recognized by these proteases, for example, the TEV model protease. And the idea is that when it cleaves at that location, that rod that's stiffening now is cut in half, so it's not able to pro provide as much stiffness uh, to the shell. It should make it more flexible. And after a bunch of tinkering about you know, where to put this uh, sequence and et cetera, uh, we ended up with uh, sensors that seem to work. So um, this, in this example, we're looking at uh, gas vesicles uh, purified that have been engineered to sense TEV. By linear imaging, whether or not you have TEV looks the same, but the nonlinear contrast increases substantially when you have this enzyme that's present and active. That's with an endopeptidase that cuts inside the protein. This works even better with processive proteases that bind somewhere on the protein, usually at the NRC terminus, and then chew it up like a spaghetti, uh, because that completely destroys the rod. And now you see this night and day um, kind of contrast. Um, and um, <clears throat> this, in, this, in these examples, TV is a viral protease, CLIPXB is a bacterial protease. We wanted to see if we could do it with a mammalian protease. And we picked uh, calpin because it's a, a calcium dependent protease. So by looking at the activity of calpin, we can indirectly look at the concentration of calcium that's present. Uh, in the media. And so here, uh, we, again, we integ integrate a cleavage sequence. And when we have both calpin and calcium present, we see this turning on of nonlinear contrast. And we can use this to follow the calcium concentration, because the more calcium concentration you have, the more active the calpin, the more the GVPC is getting cleaved, and the more flexible the gas vesicles are becoming, and the more nonlinear signal you're producing. So this is a very crude way for now to image calcium. Um, you know, crude because obviously it's irreversible, this uh, cleavage event. Uh, this is useful in some scenarios, but uh, in the future, of course, we're working on allosteric or re reversible um, kind of sensors. Um, so this doesn't just work in a test tube, it also works inside of cells. Um, we built a genetic uh, construct, all you need to focus on is this area right here, where depending on whether or not we add arabinose to these bacteria uh, that are expressing our biosensors, that'll turn on the expression of a protease. And so when we add the arabinose, we expect to see an enhancement of nonlinear uh, contrast. And indeed, that's what we see. So now this is in living uh, bacterial cells, 
And when we turn on the expression of that uh, enzyme, we can see that by ultrasound by looking at this nonlinear um, imaging. And that works not only in uh, phantoms, but also when we put these cells inside of the GI tract um, of a mouse. <clears throat> okay, so that's what I wanted to say about imaging. Um, and in the last uh, second part of the talk, um, which is shorter, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, control. And the idea kind of basically is that um, we want to have bi-directional communication. Um, you know, so far I showed you how we're starting to think about knowing where these cells are, knowing about what's happening with their genetic programs, sensing things inside of them or outside of them that are happening with molecular dynamic events. Now we want to tell these cells what to do. And that's, again, important for basic biology because you want to perturb things and see what happens. And also important for cell-based therapeutics because sometimes we want to direct their function at specific locations. You're inside the tumor, you know, you should do X. Whereas if you're in a healthy tissue, you should not uh, do X. And so how can we do that um, with um, ultrasound? And what's beautiful about ultrasound, and you know, I, our lab is learning ultrasound along the way since our expertise originally was not that, is that everything I told you about so far is in just one regime of ultrasound. It's this ping regime where we're sending a brief pulse of ultrasound is bouncing off of things and coming back to us and helping us form an image. But depending on how you apply the ultrasound, you can do a bunch of other things. So if you apply longer pulses uh, and have a certain spatial pattern <clears throat> of that acoustic uh, pressure, then you can create radiation force and push on objects. If you apply long enough pulses um, and have enough intensity, you can focus the energy and get it absorbed to heat things. Uh, and if you have bubbles present that can expand and contract significantly, then you can create cavitation and produce mechanical effects um, locally at the ultrasound focus. And we'd like to see if we can connect each of these things to biomolecules and cells. So let me start with the push, with the push regime. And this is something that's been known for a very long time that in particular, if you have a standing wave, for example, you send a, a sound into a tube, you have a reflector at the end, the sound wave gets reflected, interferes with itself, and causes a standing wave of nodes and antinodes that you can get particles to arrange themselves uh, within these uh, nodes or antinodes. You can do this at home, just buy a speaker and a reflector, get some styrofoam balls, and you can get them floating in midair uh, in this uh, spatial uh, arrangement. Uh, if you can afford an array of speakers, you can cause these particles to just dance around <clears throat> and change their pattern uh, dynamically. And of course, you know, we'd like to know if we can do a similar thing with cells. And uh, the good news for that is that the same properties that make gas vesicles good at scattering ultrasound also make them good for acoustic manipulation. So how strong a force is experienced by an object due to acoustic radiation force is a function of its density and compressibility relative to surrounding medium, which manifest as an acoustic contrast factor phi here, and uh, from just estimates of what these contrast factors are for a bunch of other materials that people have manipulated acoustically, compared to gas vesicles, we see two things. One is that the magnitude of the contrast factor for gas vesicles is about an order of magnitude higher than the previous materials, uh, like diamond, uh, for example. And the sign of the contrast factor is opposite, which means that while all of these materials to the left of this dashed line will go to acoustic nodes, minima of pressure, the gas vesicles will go to antinodes, to higher pressure. So it gives us a way to separate them from other materials, including cells, right? Uh, cells that, that don't have gas vesicles. And so um, we wondered whether we could use ultrasound to manipulate both purified gas vesicles and cells expressing gas vesicles. And here, just for summary in the next couple of slides, <clears throat> I'll show you data from manipulating cells that are expressing gas vesicles. And so what we have in these examples are bacteria that are engineered to express gas vesicles inside of them. And uh, based on the level of expression of the gas vesicles, their, their contrast factor turns negative, meaning that we expect them to go to levels of higher acoustic pressure. We put them into a microfluidic channel. They're fluorescently labeled so we can see them. And we're gonna apply ultrasound to create a minima of pressure here and maxima at the sides. And we expect the bacteria to go to the walls. So let me turn on the video and whoop, we see the cells going to the walls. And that only happens when they're expressing the gas vesicles because <clears throat> bacteria on their own are actually too small to even go to the center of the channel even though they're, they're, they're denser compared to 
media. So when we express these acoustic foragings, we can get the bacteria to move. Uh, we don't have to just get them to go to the wall. We can create cooler arrangements. So for example, uh, we can apply, uh, pick a frequency where we have several nodes and antinodes, um, turn on the ultrasound, we get the cells to arrange themselves, and then change the frequency, which changes the locations of the attractor points, and we can get the bacteria to dance around. If we have a tightly focused beam, we can also create an attractor point at the focus. So here, we're gonna uh, have the suspension of bacteria. When we turn on the ultrasound, we see them clumping together at the focus. Uh, and then we can drag that focus around. Um, <clears throat> and you know, write out a spatial, te spatial temporal pattern. Uh, and we'll see this pattern in just a second. And this is, oops. Uh, no. Okay, well, anyway, the punchline was that it says CIT uh, for California Institute of Technology, but of course you can just add a little uh, dash and you get a GIT. Uh, but um, the other thing we can do with this now is to pattern the cells. Um, and so to, to the idea here is that we, we have a uniform suspension of cells, but we want to start them off in a certain spatial arrangement. For example, then they can um, carry out some kind of spatially defined function or start off a kind of a developmental program to create the rest of the function that we want. And what we're doing is we're suspending these cells in a gel before it's gelled, okay? So it's still liquid. During that time, we're gonna apply an acoustic pattern while the gel is gelling, okay? So that by the time it's done, the cells are gonna be in a certain spatial arrangement. And we wanted to move to more sophisticated spatial arrangements. So we teamed up with um, Pierre Fisher's group at Max Planck Institute, where they can create these little phase plates that from a uniform acoustic field can create a hologram that creates uh, attractors at a certain location. So in this case, we're taking one that has this letter R uh, pattern. And so when we do that, we can get our bacterial cells to arrange themselves in this R spatial pattern. We can see that very clearly here just by, by eye. Uh, and also with ultrasound as well. So this opens the, the opportunity now to create kind of more sophisticated uh, patterns in media where light patterning is gonna be difficult uh, because you know here it's thin so we can see it with light, but as you get to deeper or more opaque materials, it's gonna be hard to do light where a sound doesn't care uh, and can go through and create these kind of uh, patterns. Okay, so that's the, the pushing regime. Now, how about these other two, cavitation and heating? And these are really designed to take advantage of the ability of ultrasound to be focused spatially. And this is something that um, you know, has been developed over several decades. Uh, and actually therapeutic ultrasound, I think, predates the diagnostic ultrasound. And the key is that just like you can focus light with a lens uh, and burn a piece of paper, you can focus ultrasound with a lens or with a curved transducer uh, to focus on a point and steer that point uh, around with millimeter uh, precision and deposit either mechanical energy or thermal energy depending on the regime of ultrasound you're using. And this is actually used uh, clinically, for example, to ablate uterine fibroids or the subthalamic nucleus in the brain, um, in this case thermal, but can also be done with cavitation. And so I'm gonna talk briefly about both of those regimes. So let's start with um, cavitation. And <clears throat> so normally this is something that's done with bubbles. And the idea is that if you're coming in with a low frequency, relatively low frequency of ultrasound and high enough amplitude, you can get the bubbles to um, expand and contract, it's called cavitation, and that can produce local mechanical phenomena. Now, with gas vesicles on their own, that doesn't happen very much because the buckling motion that they're producing is like relatively small, it's compression only, and it's gentle you know, compared to what bubbles can do. But it turns out that we can collapse the gas vesicles with pressure. So if we apply a high enough acoustic pressure, the shell breaks, the air that's inside of them gets liberated as a little nano bubble. And now if we leave it alone, like we're doing with the imaging ultrasound after our ping, this bubble will get dissolved in less than a millisecond and be gone forever. But if we have a continuing wave of ultrasound that's now gonna have a significant negative pressure cycle, then this little bubble is gonna get expanded by the negative pressure. And over several cycles, several of these bubbles will group together and form a larger bubble, where now that bubble is large enough that it can undergo this powerful inertial cavitation and create a large uh, set of mechanical effects. And so we could see this uh, acoustically. So we're, when we apply the appropriate ultrasound regime, 
Uh, first of all, for those of you who are in the ultrasound field, will recognize that this big broadband signal that we're getting uh, from the gas vesicles indicates that we have inertial cavitation going on. For those of you who um, are not in ultrasound and want to see things with your own eyes, uh, we borrowed a uh, 5 million frame per second camera from our aeronautics department uh, to image this directly. Uh, and so here we're going to look at some cancer cells that have gas vesicles attached to their surface. Um, initially, this is a uh, you know, 1 million fold slowed down video. We just see the texture of the cells. We can't see the gas vesicles directly because they're too small. But we start applying ultrasound and keep watching here. After some time, we're going to start to see the formation and cavitation of these bubbles. Okay? And so those bubbles arose because we had gas vesicles that were attached uh, to those cells. And so, and what that's doing here is it's killing the cancer cells. So we can look at the entry of uh, uh, fluorophore into these cancer cells that happens specifically when you have gas vesicles attached and when you're applying uh, this ultrasound. So we've kind of turned our innocent little gas vesicle into a bomb that we put on a cell and then we're detonating it. Now what's even cooler is if we can turn our innocent little cells into bombs. Uh, and so this is a cartoonist representation. We have um, uh, a cell with gas vesicles and bam, uh, with ultrasound we cause a little explosion. And the idea is that this can cause local, local mechanical damage if we want, um, or can cause release of a payload that's expressed inside of the cell. So if we co-express a therapeutic protein or as a model of fluorophore or luminescent protein, then we can trigger its release. And so indeed that turns out uh, to work. So we have cells, uh, bacterial cells that are expressing, expressing a luminescent protein. Um, and we see this release of bioluminescence specifically when we apply ultrasound and have the cells expressing gas vesicles. Uh, and that works in mammalian cells as well. Here we're looking at our ability to kind of detonate and you know, kill the cell itself um, with, um, with ultrasound. And so now we're applying this to um, uh, a few scenarios specifically related to, um, to tumors. Okay. so. I'm focusing on ultrasound. I know there's some people in the audience who don't, you know, not that they don't like ultrasound, but they, they're interested in magnetics or optics or other kind of techniques. And I just want to say that for those of you, um, uh, ultras uh, gas vesicles also have magnetic and optical effects. And it's very simple. Like all the stuff I talked about for acoustics is based on the acoustic, uh, on the uh, in, uh, acoustic impedance being different between air and water. Um, the magnetic susceptibility is also different between air and water, and the index of refraction is also different between air and water. So you can see these things with susceptibility-weighted MRI. You can see them with optical coherence tomography and uh, phase uh, holography. Uh, and so there's you know, a few other applications I just want to kind of mention there. Okay, in the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk about this last regime that I haven't yet mentioned that involves heating and does not involve gas vesicles. Um, so I'm going to talk about something a little bit different here. Um, and <clears throat> um, again, the idea here is that ultrasound can be focused. And uh, normally, it's applied at high enough intensity that you're heating the tissue sufficiently that you're ablating it. Uh, but in our case, we don't want to ablate things. We want to use it as a signal to tell cells what to do. And so what we're going to do is stay within the temperature regime at the focus between 37 and 42 degrees that's been well documented to be tolerated by most tissues. So we can have that temperature elevation for up to about an hour and um, the tissues are fine. And the idea is that we're going to engineer our cells to have a temperature sensor in them that's going to sense the small elevation in temperature and turn on some kind of therapeutic program uh, locally. And I'm just going to summarize uh, quite a, a bunch of work that was done initially in bacteria. And so here, we are dealing with temperature-dependent transcriptional repressors. We obtain them from naturally evolved uh, sources and then tune them through directed evolution. And the, the key thing about them is that these temperature-dependent repressors have more than 300-fold switching between the cold state and the on state, where this transition between states happens over a very small range of temperatures, just about 3 degrees Celsius. And, and we uh, created a way to tune them so that we can create different versions of them that operate at different switch points. So you can tell me what temperature you want to switch at, and I can send you, or actually you can just um, uh, order from AdGene, a uh, thermal bio switch that operates at that temperature. And you can see all of them have this very nice switch-like uh, behavior. And so what, lets us, what that lets us do now is to control gene expression patterns with ultrasound. Uh, and so in this in vitro example, we have a lawn of bacteria that are expressing two different colors with two different levels of thermal switching. 
uh, we apply focused ultrasound to heat them up. We can see by MRI guidance the pattern of temperature that we uh, imposed and later see the gene expression pattern that we obtained. And so here you see that we were able to paint a bullseye of gene expression with ultrasound. And this worked uh, in vitro. It also works in vivo. And our earliest um, <clears throat> work, we were just injecting the, the bacteria in a few different locations in a mouse, only applying ultrasound to one particular location and subsequently seeing genes uh, turning on at that location. Now, in our latest work um, that is not yet published, we're using this to release uh, anti-tumor therapy locally inside tumors. So now we've engineered uh, E. coli nissel cells that can migrate into uh, tumors, as we saw um, earlier. And we have a thermal bio switch in them that converts this very brief temperature uh, input into a sustained expression based on recombinase logic of a therapeutic uh, payload. And the therapeutic payload, we're using our immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and so, for example, anti-CTLA-4. In vitro, you can see that from baseline incubation, we have nothing. And then as we, as we heat to 42 or 43 degrees, just for uh, an hour, uh, we get uh, the subsequent expression in the media. And when we do this in mice that have tumors, and we have now systemically injected the cells that we've engineered to, upon ultrasound command, release these checkpoint inhibitors, then we activate them locally just inside the tumor with focused ultrasound by heating it up to these temperatures here and we measure the tumor growth as a function of time we see that when we combine the therapeutic microbes with ultrasound we see this marked reduction in the growth rate of the tumor which you don't get just from the ultrasound by itself or just from these therapeutic microbes and the idea is that here we're activating them locally inside the tumor and so that that alleviates the concern that a lot of people have about the fact that these systemically injected microbes don't only go to the tumor, but some of them also go to the liver and spleen and bone marrow. Uh, and so this potentially allows you to have a more aggressive therapy that you can apply locally. Now, in addition to bacteria, we're interested in doing this in uh, mammalian cells. And so we've done some work with primary T cells that I know also is a great interest to Gabe uh, Kwong and others at, at Georgia Tech. Um, and the idea is that, you know, with, with T cells, they also have uh, on-target off-tumor toxicity potential. And so if you can tell them spatially that they're in the right place to activate their strong therapy, uh, you can increase the safety margin that you're, that you're creating. And so here we're using uh, heat shock promoters, taking advantage of endogenous heat response uh, in mammalian cells and using that to control the expression of a chimeric antigen receptor in human primary T cells. And uh, in this study, this was in vitro, we can see that when we activate the circuit with uh, temperature, we see the decline of cancer cells. Whereas if we don't activate them, <clears throat> then the, the cancer cells uh, stay alive. So it's a way to thermally trigger um, the uh, functionality of mammalian uh, immune cells. Um, it's okay. All right, I think I have maybe two more minutes uh, before Q&A. So I wanna just tell you one, one last thing uh, about ultrasound that I, I know is of interest to, um, to some of you. Um, and that's actually connecting it to the brain. Uh, and so the last uh, kind of story here is about the fact that if we wanna treat diseases like epilepsy or depression or addiction, a lot of them are diseases of circuits in the brain, which means that to treat them, we wanna target a specific location. And at that location, we wanna target specific cell types and we wanna do it at a specific time. So how can we do that and do it non-invasively? And the technology we came up with is called acoustically targeted chemogenetics. The idea being that we use focused ultrasound to specify the part of the brain that we want to actuate. And at that location, we're gonna be uh, applying ultrasound in a way that transiently opens the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and this is something that's been developed over uh, a couple decades by, by other groups. Um, and the thing that's gonna enter the brain at that BBB open location are gonna be AAV viral vectors that under cell type specific promoter will cause expression of chemogenetic receptors, which will sensitize the neurons just at that location and just of that cell type to small molecules that can subsequently be administered systemically that can turn those neurons on or off. And uh, blood-brain barrier opening, like I said, is something that's been developed for a long time. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but the remarkable thing is just in the last couple of years, there've been beautiful works you know, showing that it works in humans. So this is like opening a little window into the blood-brain barrier in a human subject. Um, so we're taking advantage of that. 
We're taking advantage of AAV viral vectors, which are now an FDA approved type of uh, gene therapy. And they're gonna be uh, carrying our gene of interest under a cell type specific promoter. So we can say just excitatory cells or just inhibitory cells. And the genes we're expressing are these chemogenetic receptors, which are receptors that have been engineered to no longer respond to neurotransmitters and instead respond to designer drugs that are small molecules that cross the BBB and don't act on anything else other than these receptors. And the idea is that you have a brief ultrasound treatment in conjunction with systemic injection of the viral vector. It only enters at that location in the brain and you give a few weeks for expression. And subsequently, when you want to turn that brain region on or off, you just give the small uh, molecule. And um, we tested this initially in uh, mice and we wanted to see if we can control the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that's responsible for memory formation, among other things. We can see by MRI where we've opened the blood brain barrier because we're injecting some contrast agent together with our viral vector. Uh, subsequently, we can see the pattern of gene expression that we obtained. So here, non-invasively, we were able to paint the hippocampus, both dorsally and ventrally, uh, to get expression of our gene. We use the cell type specific promoter. So now we're getting expression only in uh, excitatory cells that are marked by this CAMK2 uh, biomarker. And so now what we can do is a behavioral experiment where what we're doing is we're with this chemical molecule, uh, we are shutting temporarily shutting down excitatory cells in the hippocampus. And we hypothesize that we could use this to shut down memory formation in these mice. So we do this behavioral experiment um, called fear conditioning. And the, the bottom line, just to summarize, is that we can, if we apply this chemogenetic ligand during the memory formation of the mice, we can prevent them from forming these painful memories. And uh, this is a powerful behavioral um, uh, um, demonstration. And now we're trying to apply it to a bunch of other basic neuro neuroscience questions. Uh, as well as potential clinical scenarios, and we have to improve every aspect of this technology. All right, I'm out of time. So I want to give a couple conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, um, ultrasound is pretty awesome, um, and I define awesome here at the bottom of the slide along several dimensions, and many of you already knew that. Um, what I think is new is that it is just becoming possible to interface ultrasound with cells using genetic tools. Um, and we're in very early days of this, and this creates many uh, possibilities and challenges that I hope our lab and other groups that are interested in this topic will uh, take on to move forward. And lastly, um, I'd like to thank my lab. I credited the people that are working on every project at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the slides. It's a wonderful multidisciplinary group. This is from uh, one of our recent beach parties that I hope we'll, we'll have again uh, in the near future, um, and great collaborators around the world. And I want to thank you guys for inviting me and uh, for your attention during the talk. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, this is where everybody is clapping uh, inside their heads. So, um, so thanks so much for a great talk. Um, it was really exciting. There are a number of questions here that have been asked both publicly and then privately. So I'm going to start with one of the questions that was asked by uh, Nathan Bowen. And Nathan asks, does the expression of the vesicle proteins or the ultrasound itself induce any kind of stress response uh, signature within, within mammalian cells? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so we've done relatively little of kind of detailed investigation of that. We've done some RNA-seq uh, experiments. And we, we do, under one condition that we've tested, see upregulation of uh, ubiquitin pathway genes. And, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, what that what that means exactly. So yeah, I think, you know, I think, and that's just from expressing the gas vesicle. So, so there does seem to be um, some kind of response. But what we've seen is that when we look carefully and compare that to what's happening with overexpression of GFP or other fluorescent proteins is that you get a similar kind of thing with those as well. Um, so it's not clear if it's something specific to gas vesicles or it's just kind of taxing the cell to produce a bunch of, of a foreign protein. Uh, but definitely something that, you know, we need to continue to investigate. As a quick follow-up to that, um, when you think about the sort of toxicological or or immunological effects that um, you know could be driven by something like this, what do you think is going to be unique to the gas vesicles, and what do you think you know as opposed to as you just mentioned stuff that sort sort of doesn't require yeah. the gas vesicle? Um, well, I think. Um, maybe two things like one hypothetically like the gas vesicles take up more volume in the cell per unit protein mass so 
you know, if we really drive the expression hard, like what happens to the cell if you like occupy 10% of its cytoplasm? Um, we don't have to do that to get our ultrasound signals. Um, so, but I think that's one kind of interesting possibility. You'd have to express a crap ton of GFP to occupy 10% of the volume. Um, the second one is that it's an unusual, the sub the subunit proteins are also unusual because like to get this air compartment, the interior of the gastroesophageal shell is very hydrophobic. So the GVPA subunits that form it have a hydrophilic face and a hydrophobic face. And what we found in some experiments is that if you just express GVPA by itself and you don't have the chaperones there to productively use it, then that can create some toxicity. And you know, it could be just you have this hydrophobic protein that's aggregating. So I think we have the added challenge slash, slash opportunity that we have this consortium of proteins that are working together. And so the stoichiometry control becomes important. And that's that's been you know one of the uh, major synthetic biology focuses in our lab recently. Um, I will just add a quick comment that we think about these same sorts of questions within the context of mRNA. And we've done now measurements to show that with a great mRNA delivery vehicle, you can get up to two to three percent of the total transcripts in the cell are from what you've delivered. And wow. the question is, what does that mean for the cell? And my guess is that it's going to vary cell cell type by cell type. That some are going to be more amenable or accepting to that than others. I'd be I, I bet you it's going to be the same with yours as well. Cool. Okay, so I have a cool. second question from from Phoebe uh, Phoebe uh, Welch who asks: These gas vesicles can be cavitated with focus ultrasound, but I remember seeing that gas vesicles can be collapsed and re-expressed in mammalian cells. What accounts for the different acoustic behavior of these gas vesicles? Yeah, excellent question. So it's the same, the same gas vesicles can be both collapsed non-cavitatingly and cavitated. And the difference is that to collapse them, all we need is that ping pulse, just a very brief couple cycle pulse uh, that is a, that has an amplitude above their critical collapse pressure. And that causes the shell to break and they collapse irreversibly. And then, like you said, can subsequently be re-expressed. To get them to cavitate, you have to use uh, lower frequencies more extended pulses and higher pressures because not only do you need to break the shell but now you need to take that nanobubble and cause it to expand and contract over a number of cycles to get it to coalesce into a microbubble. So the regimes for imaging and therapy are thankfully quite distinct from each other and we you know we're doing studies now where we have cells that are infiltrating somewhere we can first image them with ultrasound, make sure that they're there, they're in the right place, and then change the ultrasound transducer to the one that's causing cavitation and produce therapy. Perfect. Phoebe, I see you nodding along. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so to, to just to clarify, um, when it comes to the cavitation, you said something about like uh, gas coalescing. So do you need multiple gas vesicles to coalesce with one another in order to generate that cavitation? Yeah, um, we're still studying that. So I think that kind of the two competing hypotheses for why we get efficient, uh, especially inertial cavitation, is uh, um, coalescence or rectified diffusion of gas into the bubbles as they're uh, going over stable cavitation cycles. And we're still trying to distinguish between those two possibilities. So if it's rectified diffusion, then in, in principle, a single, gas, a single gas vesicle should be enough. But in practice, in most of the scenarios that we're testing, like you know, cells expressing gas vesicles or cells with gas vesicles attached to them. Usually there's, you know, several gas vesicles in the vicinity. So um, I think we need to do more, more work to distinguish from one from the other. Perfect. And I, there are two, two last questions I'd like to ask. Um, the first is from Christopher Carlson. And Christopher asks, how does the response time of gas vesicle GVPC biosensor, how does the, uh, how of this biosensor compare to a similar uh, fluorescent uh, biosensor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and short answer is we don't know. I like for, for, the, for the protease sensors that I talked about, um, that entire process is limited by the kinetics of the enzyme. Uh, and so we're able to follow the kinetics of that enzyme, you know, as it cleaves the gasoskull shell, uh, you know, we see an increase in um, the nonlinear contrast. Um, and I think that's exactly the same thing that happens with fluorescence-based uh, sensors. Um, now that we're starting to work on allosteric reversible sensors um, that have a faster uh, event that's triggering them, um, we're starting to really get into the kinetics. And I don't think there's anything fundamental about the gas vesicles that should make them slower than their fluorescent counterparts. I mean, you, you, know, you, you do have the fact that you have many copies of GVPC on the gas vesicle shell. 
But um, if you if you kind of take the first order um, approximation that um, the nonlinear contrast will be proportional to amount of GVPC that's acted on by whatever molecule it's sensing, uh, the kinetics should be similar to GFP sensor being acted on by whatever molecule it's sensing. So we don't have any reason to believe intrinsically that it's going to be slower, but of course um, that um, you know, awaits experimental verification. Perfect. And then for the last question in this open session, um, uh, I'll have Felipe um, ask the question. Felipe, go ahead. Thanks, James. Uh, looking forward to meeting you a little later, but uh, and I have a number of questions, but I figured this one this one might be relevant to to the audience. Uh, really beautiful work and all this effort to bring these complex circuits into mammalian cells is, is really amazing. Uh, but you did mention some interesting efforts in the protein engineering side, and it's quite remarkable that these structures, you know, are so uh, monodispersed. And and certainly some of the applications that you mentioned, uh, there is this idea that it would be useful to uh, engineer the surface of these particles, right, to control their delivery to specific sites, for instance. So mm -hmm. if you could just comment a little bit on on how you guys are thinking about engineering the surface of these particles to yeah. maybe drive their, their uh, localization. Yeah, thank you. For that. That's a great question. Um, so we, we, we have engineered the surface. I didn't really uh, talk about it, but uh, we have two ways of doing that. Um, so one is genetically, um, and we do that through GVPC, the protein that I mentioned for the sensing, because it tolerates fusions to both of its termini. And so we've attached uh, things like um, uh, surface uh, charge changing things like lysine rich, rich peptides. We've attached uh, RGD tags. Uh, we've attached fluorescent proteins. So it kind of tolerates you know, quite a bit of functionalities through genetic uh, fusion. Um, and secondly, um, we can chemically functionalize them. So if you're gonna use them in the context where you're gonna purify the gas vesicles and put something um, uh, you know, try to target them somewhere in the body through injection. Uh, we've put everything from fluorophores to clickable uh, reactive groups to PEG to um, um, you know antibodies on, on them. So you know it's pretty amenable. You know you can treat it like another um, nanoparticle with the bonus that they're pretty easy to purify because they float. Uh, so after you do your modification reaction, you just do some centrifugation and collect the stuff that's at the top of the tube. How about morphology? Like, if you look, when you look at cross-organisms, like, are you seeing a lot of diversity there? Because that's, of course, something really interesting yeah, to manipulate yeah, as well. Yeah, that's another excellent question. Yeah. Um, so we have some control over the morphology. I mean, they tend to be, they tend to have the basic pattern that they have, like, conical ends, and in the middle have a cylindrical or... Um, uh, um, Kind of uh, by con like extended by conical type of structure, um, but uh, we can't. Yeah, so we 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 have some uh, control over the diameter of them, uh, and we can have some control over their length. Uh, and the length is actually controlled by the ratios of the genes, because it turns out that this is like a nucleation and elongation formation process. So by changing the concentrations of the nucleation factors versus the elongation ingredients. Uh, you can also get a range of um, of lengths. And one one cool thing I mentioned that I didn't I want to mention that I didn't emphasize at all is that in bacteria, they you know they already have a pretty high aspect ratio, but they they rarely get larger than like a micron in length. When we started expressing them in mammalian cells, we've actually seen gas vesicles extend to like eight microns in length while keeping a diameter of a hundred. I uh, sorry no eight eight nanometers. Oh, no, no no sorry eight eight microns in length. While keeping a diameter of 100 nanometers, so that's like a you know a crazy aspect ratio, and we have no idea if that's good for anything. Uh, but I thought you know people might find that that's kind of cool. That's Amazing. a crazy Thanks. aspect ratio. Um, okay, so uh, I think we we should end it there. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Shapiro again for coming and presenting. Uh, we had a ton of people in the audience. I think everybody's really engaged. And thanks for those who reached out and asked questions and. This is where people clap or they, whatever, I give obnoxious thumbs up, thank but, you, you know, great job. Um, and uh, thank you again uh, so much for taking the time to, to present. And the next step is the one-on-one -on -one meeting. So thank you, uh, Mikhail, very much. Yeah, thank you, guys.